We are in 1 John 2, 12. 1 John 2, 12. I want us to back up, though, and begin reading uh, in verse 3 and go through verse 17. Um, because that's kind of the whole thought that we're looking at. And we looked at a couple of pieces of it last week and want to uh, continue those thoughts. So <clears throat> 1 John 2, beginning in verse 3. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever he says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing to you uh, no new commandment, but an old commandment that you heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. All right, so <clears throat> he's talking to us about how we walk in this particular section. And you remember last week we went through and we talked about obedience and how there was <clears throat> uh, kind of a sneering at obedience. Uh, and in certain circles, that's still very much alive. Obedience is considered to be something that is suspect. Like, if <clears throat> you think obeying God is important, that means that you think you can earn your way to God. That's not true. You can obey God from the right motive without believing that it earns you anything before God. Okay? But that's, uh, we'll talk more about that in the application side, hopefully here at the end, uh, where that thought developed and how we need to take a, <clears throat> a proper approach to it. God doesn't tell us. He doesn't, in the New Testament, you can go through and you can read the imperatives. When you look in the Greek text, the imperative, which is not hard to understand. If it's an imperative, it's a command. There are commands all over the New Testament. If he doesn't expect us to obey them, then why make them an imperative? Just suggest them. Obedience must play somewhere along the way. And trying to locate that and be accurate in that location can prove difficult. And then in verses 7 through 11, dealing with brotherly love, which was obviously an issue with the group that was teaching. Um, this <clears throat> hyper-elitism that developed amongst them that um, you can see very quickly how they would come to despise and look down on. Oh, you haven't been given the, you don't have that special knowledge like I have it. And what John is saying, well, if you are a grade A jerk and hate your brother, you don't have that light either. It's just that simple. And you know, <clears throat> there are a lot of people who still have that problem. And one of the things that I have said to, to them in conversation and in other places discussing uh, that scenario is this. Even if what they are saying is right, how they say it is wrong, and therefore, they are wrong. Okay? You can't <clears throat> say truth in an unloving way and say, well, I'm standing for truth. No, you're not. Truth, part of truth is love. And anybody who tries to divorce the two well, either can't read or isn't trying to interpret Scripture faithfully. So you can see how this attitude develops. Now, where we pick up 
<clears throat> now is talking about a love for the wor- or love for God versus a love for the world. And you remember these uh, particular teachers, this influence was that it didn't matter how you lived. It, would not, it wouldn't affect your soul. And so we move from mistreating other Christians to basically saying how I live before God doesn't even really matter. And you remember we've uh, addressed some of these things in the opening chapter and in the prologue and those things, but the rest of the book will be continuously circling back to those points and saying, hey, that's not going to cut it. Okay, So, in verses 12 through 14, he does something that is, I mean, it's, it's peculiar, and, and I say it's peculiar for this reason, that he addresses little children, fathers, and young men, and then he turns right around and he addresses them again, saying virtually the same thing to both of them, right? Not much changes. If you look at the message of what is said in verses 12 in the first part of 13, not much changes in the message to those groups in 14 and the latter part of 13. And so, and it also comes across, you can see it in English, <clears throat> but notice in 12 and most of 13, he says, I am writing. These are present tense statements, I am writing. But at the end of 13 and in 14, he moves to more of a, well, in the original, it's aorist, so it's past tense. So it's, I wrote, I write to you, or I wrote to you. It would be a more faithful uh, rendering of, of what the language actually reflects. And so, it's, it's the best that I've heard, and it still doesn't make any sense to me, is that it's just a rhetorical device. That is, it's just a, something that may have been familiar to them of a way of emphasizing a point. Okay? Uh, and that's possible. I mean, he, repetition is not a, you know, it's a very common rhetorical method uh, to try and communicate to people. So, but I do want to pay attention to a number of things. First of all, that he addresses <clears throat> different groups of Christians. He addresses little children, fathers, and young men. Okay? Um, there are others that see it differently. I'm just going to give you my take. Because if we talked about every debate that ever existed about every text, well, you'd be more tired of me than you are now. But the, um, <clears throat> the idea, as I understand it, is we're dealing with Christians and their spiritual age slash maturity, okay? So you've got young children, you have people who are young in the faith, children. You've got young men, people, and by the way, this is not, again, this is, not, and we'll talk about this, this is not a physical age, this is a spiritual maturity, okay? You've got people who are young men in the faith or young women in the faith, and then you've got fathers, you've got old men, pillars, old women, pillars, in the faith and so <clears throat> he's writing to each group and what he's doing with this is reminding them something about themselves and their relationship with God and then he's using this as the foundation for what he's going to say in 15 through 17 you would you would be violating everything that you have done to go back now and act and love the world and so <clears throat> he's emphasizing the differences and again, we say these are not age differences, okay? They're not even spiritual. I think I said spiritual age differences, but that's really not even accurate. Because you can have a person who spiritually was born again 60 years ago. But they're as spiritually mature now as they were that day. Like, no growth has happened, okay? Okay? You see, we, <clears throat> many times we confuse age with growth. Now, why do we do that? Well, because you expect it. You expect people to grow as they get older. But that's not always the case. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and so just because a person has been a Christian for so many years doesn't mean that they're mature in faith at all. And so that's, you see... <clears throat> One of Brooks' favorite statements um, is that growing old is mandatory, but growing up is optional. You don't have a choice about growing old, but you do have a choice about growing up. And, it's, and you can't keep making excuses for everything else. You, you either grow up or you don't. So, <clears throat> when we look at these particular headings and these particular groups... 
I think that's what he's dealing with. He's addressing them individually and does it a second time around just maybe to emphasize the point. So, more specifically, verse 12, I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. Okay, for his name's sake, most likely a reference to Jesus. This goes back to 1 John 2, 2, and what we'll see in 1 John 4, 10, that he's the propitiation for our sins. He's the appeasement. God forgives us on his behalf, okay, because of his sacrifice. And so little children, they have been forgiven. Again, little children in the faith. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. That is, they've had a relationship with God from the very beginning. They've, they've been at this for a long time, okay? And they're solid and they're steady and they're not going anywhere. <clears throat> in, in all the years when people have fallen by the wayside, they have remained faithful and the same. And that's why um, <clears throat> Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 5 that the way he is to conduct himself with older men in the congregation is to treat them with the same respect that with which he would treat his father. Okay, And young men, you treat them as you would treat your brothers. Um, he's not wanting Timothy to go in there and be like, hey, I'm Paul's protege and I've got this figured out and you need to listen to me. <clears throat> he's saying, no, you need to go in and you need to be respectful and understand that you have a lot to learn and that there are things that people can teach you and there are ways of helping people but going in and saying I'm the solution to the problems definitely will not help anyone okay so <clears throat> but you see the designations of young men and fathers in first Timothy 5 and verse 1 so they've known him who is from the beginning they've had a, a long-lasting relationship and then he says I'm writing to you young men <clears throat> Because you have overcome the evil one. And of course the evil one is Satan. When we look throughout this letter. 1 John 3, 12, 1 John 5, 18 and 19. Uh, a bunch of other texts we could look at. So you have overcome him. You have conquered through Christ. Alright. And so now he repeats the process. I write to you children because you know the father. Okay. That's a little bit different than what he said the first time. But it's also the same. Okay, salvation in John's writings many times are referenced as knowing God. For an example, in John 17, when Jesus prayed, he said, And this is life eternal, that they would know you, the only true God. Okay, so there's an equation. You have to, we have to understand how he's using the language. And so to say, <clears throat> because you know the Father, is a way of saying, You've been forgiven. You've been adopted into the family of God. Then he says, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Okay? Which is exactly the same thing he said the first time. I write to you, young men. And here, you remember it, the, the last phrase here is, and you have overcome the evil one. But he adds these two qualifying statements. Because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. And so these young men are strong in their faith, okay? They're strong, they're steady, they're reliable. And then it says, and the word of God abides in you, which will become a, an important discussion in chapter 3 about the word of God abiding in the child of God and his relationship with sin. Um, <clears throat> but it's the idea of young men who are strong because the word of God abides in them and they overcome the evil one. All of these things are intricately connected. Okay, How does a person become strong in faith? Well, I can tell you one thing that they're going to have to have. Faith can't exist without it. You've got to have the word from God. You have to know what God says. How can you have faith? Faith is produced by hearing the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. We've heard that verse from the time we were kids in churches of Christ. And so <clears throat> if there's not a relationship with the word of God, there can't be any strength. And there's a reason why they have grown from infancy, from being children in faith, to being young men. They have fed themselves. They have feasted themselves steadily 
upon what God has said, and it has strengthened them. It has made them, okay? And so, <clears throat> um, it's an important formula. When you, when you see these three levels of Christians and how they're all interrelated to each other, connected to each other, how they help one another, um, it's important. But as far as our context, we'll come back to the practical side here in a minute. As far as our context, he's trying to remind them that from children to young men to fathers, all of you have a relationship with God. And what that implies, to become into a relationship with God, you have to make a break with the world. You cannot continue to love the world, which is going to be the subject that he spends the next three verses talking about. Okay? So, understanding who you are. Okay? So, <clears throat> uh, without going too far into psychology, um, many of us have a constructed identity of who we are. People say, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. I'm not saying you sat down and thought it through logically, but you have an idea of who you are. You live by that. Okay? Like that or not. That's <clears throat> kind of like, you know, I hear, <laughs> I hear some people pontificate and they say, look, I don't need philosophy in the church. Well, what do you say to that? That's an interesting philosophy. That is a philosophy. You don't get a choice of whether you have it. You get a choice of what kind you have. Okay? So we have an identity that we act from. And that identity is formed and shaped by tons of different things. But part of becoming a Christian, and this is not a part that we talk about very much, part of becoming a Christian is receiving a new identity. God is going to reform and reshape your identity. So a lot of people have an identity that even though they don't say it this way and they don't even think of it in this way they have an identity and they operate from an identity that says I'm worthless let me give you one that's classic you can usually tell a lot about a person's identity well at a number of levels but when a person makes a mistake how they think about their mistake tells me a lot about their identity for an example, I've seen people make simple mistakes, silly mistakes that everybody else has made, and they go, oh, I'm so stupid. Don't talk to yourself that way. A mistake does not make you stupid, but what concerns me is that's the identity that you're, you're operating from. You see yourself as an inferior being. Instead of looking at yourself realistically, which says what? Oh my, everybody else in the world has made a mistake. I made a mistake. It's not the end of the world. People say, why does this matter? Well, because it fuels what you do. And what John is trying to say is, in Christ you've been given a new identity and you have to act in ways that are consistent with your new identity. No, you're not unlovable, regardless of how many people have communicated to you in your life that you are. You are loved and cherished and adored. And you have to act from that identity and act in, that, act in your relationship with God according to that identity. Um, <clears throat> but John's focus here is... You've been given an identity. You've become a child of God. You've been born into his family. So that means the things with which you once viewed with great affection, you no longer view them that way. Okay? And that doesn't happen instantaneously. Okay? That, that's a process. Right? Um... I've known a lot of uh, alcoholics in my life. Um, a lot of times I was related to many of them. Um, <clears throat> I've known people who have beaten it. I've known people who didn't. 
Um, but what's interesting is to see the process of the people who beat it based on their Christian identities. Their Christian identity. Is, you know, they'll tell you, look, I had to, I had to get rid of it. And for years, I still had that. I still had that inclination, like I still wanted to go do it, and I would still give in to it on occasion. But now I've gotten to the point where it literally has no appeal to me anymore. You see, their identity has been so formed now that even their affections have changed. The things that they used to love, the things that used to draw them, don't draw them anymore. And that's part of what becoming a Christian is. It doesn't mean that God is going to magically flip a switch in you that says every one of your sinful desires is now turned into a good desire. But you give me time, you submit yourself to my will, you will learn at some point. And this is the great tragedy in my mind, is that some people have still yet to learn to serve God with joy. They still view him as the person who's like the gatekeeper who won't let me do it. He won't let me do what I want to do. And really what that is is massive immaturity. Right? Right? We understand that. Listen, if a 16-year-old says, look, my parents won't let me stay out till whatever time I want to and come in whenever I want to, what do we say to that? You're immature. I love you, but you're immature. You have no idea. They have no idea what happens in those hours, do they? None. You have no idea what can happen to you in those hours. Well, you're just... You're just being, you know, you're just trying to keep me from having fun. That's not it. Okay, we can see that with a teenager, but why can't we see that with God? When he's putting up boundaries and bridges, he's not saying, oh, he just, you know, he doesn't want us to do any of that. He just, you know, he doesn't want us to have fun. Who gave you the ability to even have fun? He could have created us without the ability to enjoy anything. Maybe he understands how that joy is best fulfilled. And so, in the process of having our identities formed, what John is now going to deal with is, okay, remember who you are. Now, who you are then will dictate something about how you view the world. Okay, so he says <clears throat> in verses 15 through 17, uh, <clears throat> do not love the world. Do not love the world. It's a prohibition, okay? Or the things that are in the world. That's the first sentence. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Okay, so what does he mean by not love the world? You'd be surprised what some people can come up with when they look at these things. What does he mean by not loving the world? Hate nature? Exactly. What he's dealing with, and in verse 16, you remember he says, don't love the world or the things in the world. Verse 16, he's going to tell us the things that are in the world that we're not supposed to do. That we're not supposed to... Uh, um, give ourselves over to not only should Christians enjoy the world I'm of the opinion that they can enjoy it better than anybody else I believe that we can look at the world we can see all of these things as gracious gifts from God given to us to enjoy there's nothing wrong with loving and enjoying creation, enjoying being out. There's nothing wrong with, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm not a hunting person, but uh, I know that's a big shock for most of you, but um, I'm not a hunting person. 
But that's, I mean, I can see the appeal of going and sitting out in nature quiet. There's nothing wrong with you loving to do that. There's nothing wrong with enjoying hiking, even though I don't, <laughs> that, that's not mine either. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll go, but it's got to be like Crater Lake National Park. We're driving to the top. All right. <laughs> we're here, and we're walking out, and it's a beautiful thing if you've never seen Crater Lake National Park. It was a volcano that erupted, and the top blew off, and then it filled back in with water, and it's, it's beautiful. It's in Oregon. <clears throat> um, but you know you can you can enjoy those things that's not what God means when he says don't love the world what he means is don't love the world is synonymous with the sinful things of the world James 4 and verse 4 not to be adulterers and adulteresses the person who would be a friend of the world is the enemy of God that embraces world mindsets and sinful mindsets. That's the thing that he's against. He says, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, a lot of people will balk and really push back at this thing. I remember hearing a preacher one time talk about, he was preaching on Matthew 7, 13, and 14, and uh, we have the two ways of course the easy and the difficult ways and he's they said to him they're like look you're just making this extreme it's, it's you're saying there's like two ways but there's got to be like this third row where you know you're I mean you're just being a little radical and he's like but Jesus didn't give a third row I mean, you can be lost, and I've been lost in the pig paths of Arkansas many times going to preach. Um, well, I'm not saying that because I said I'd never preach in Alabama and Kentucky, and it's the only two places I've ever preached. But if I can help it, Arkansas will not be the place where I live and preach. Um, I've been lost there countless times. And you know, you can get mad and say, why are there only two roads? I want a third one. Well, you want it all day long. But there's only two roads if you want to exit this state. And you're going to have to pick one of them. And what, he's, what God is saying is you cannot, listen, the agenda of the world and the agenda of God are so diametrically opposed to each other. It's, it's hard, to, it's, it's impossible to even illustrate. I mean, <clears throat> the world says follow your heart go after your dreams do what you want to do it's your life you know you only live once and and all these things it, it, go after that go after yourself the message of God is die to yourself live for everybody else around you it's completely different if any man loves the world Listen, you can't claim to love the sinful selfishness of the world and love God at the same time. They're two different people. They're two different beings. They're two different approaches to life. <clears throat> and so he says, so this is what is in the world. The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's not from the Father, but it's of the world. God didn't... God does not promote these types of things. The desires of the flesh, matter of fact, God says the flesh and the spirit war against each other. You have this internal conflict. And people say, well, <laughs> it's interesting, we struggle as Christians because we say, well, I kind of have this desire to go and do this, but I know it's not right. Does that make me bad? No, that makes you a person who is battling the flesh and the spirit. It makes you normal. We all have things that we would like to do here and there that aren't the right thing. Listen, to sit there and have somebody correct you when they know absolutely nothing what they're talking about and you got to sit there and grin and just... <laughs> That's not what you want to do. 
That's not what your flesh is telling you to do. Your flesh is make them feel this tall. Show them just how ridiculous they are. Show them just how little they know. But the Spirit says, I'm holding a person who's made in the image of God. And if I destroy this person, God will destroy me. What difference does it make if he thinks he's right? I don't have to prove anything. So you get that battle. Desires of the flesh. Physical desires. Things that feel good. Is sin pleasurable? I love asking that question in church because people are always afraid. They don't know how to answer it. Is sin pleasurable? Yes! Like that's, that's not a secret. I mean, first of all, God said it. He knows it is. Hebrews 11, that's what Moses' calculation was in his mind. He would rather suffer now than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin for a season. This is why one writer in Christianity has made his whole, I mean, his whole ministry is based upon not denying that sin is pleasurable, but affirming that God is more pleasurable. That's his whole ministry. And further, I mean, if, <laughs> if sin was not pleasurable, then why would everybody be? You don't see a bunch of people running around taking a hatchet and just cutting their leg off. Why? <laughs> it doesn't feel, I mean, that's not a hard question. It doesn't feel good. The question is not about whether or not sin is pleasurable because it is. The problem is the things that are attached to it in Hebrews 11 and here is that the pleasures of sin are fleeting, they're passing, they're momentary, they don't abide. And therefore, pleasure <clears throat> is something that the world cannot sustain. That's the issue. God is not anti us experiencing all different types of pleasures. He gave us the ability, the sensibilities in our bodies and other places to enjoy those types of pleasures. And what he is saying is, look, you got a choice. You can do some things in this world that will be pleasurable, but they'll be momentarily pleasurable. Or you can be like the psalmist that says, Psalm 16, in your presence is the fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is not trying to keep you from pleasure. He's trying to bring you into pleasure's ultimate expression. That's what God is doing. You're doing something that will make you happy for a moment. God is saying, I'm doing something that will make you happy forever. Two different things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the desires of the eyes. I see it, I want it, I take it. What feels good, lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, there's an appeal there. So I want that and I'll take that and I'll conquer that and I'll do whatever. Whatever Solomon says this clearly in Ecclesiastes in his great scientific experiment. He said, look, whatever my eyes desired, I didn't withhold it from them. If I wanted it, I got it. And he's not just talking about stuff. And what's interesting is to listen to Solomon's statements throughout Ecclesiastes. When he says, shortly after he says, whatever my eyes desired... I did not keep from them. You know what he says just a few verses later? And therefore, I hated life. Comedian Jim Carrey has famously said, I wish that everybody in the world could have all their dreams come true so they'd realize that won't make you happy.
Robin Williams said <clears throat> that the problem with wanting to be famous is, is that the day after you become famous, you wake up in your bed and you realize you're still the same person. Not one thing's changed. You just got a little bit more money, a little more recognition. Or as Matthew Perry famously said in his biography, I prayed for God to make me famous. I prayed for the wrong thing. These are not Christian people saying this. These are people in the world who are saying it doesn't make a difference. It's deceptive. So the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and then the pride of life. Or some translations, um, I forget, the NIV had an interesting take. Uh, what does it say? The boasting of what he has and does. The boasting of what he has and does. Uh, <clears throat> most likely having reference to possessions. Um, because the same word is used later in our, in our book, in chapter 3 and verse 17, to describe possessions. So he's talking about taking pride or being boastful in our possessions. Okay? Notice, he doesn't say anything about possessions. A possession is just a possession. It's neither good nor bad. Okay? Neither good or bad won't do one thing you leave a possession where it is sitting and if nobody touches it you know what it'll still be doing sitting there you know what you won't read about your watch didn't get up and go shoot somebody at a grocery store it's just a possession it's amoral the problem is in boasting in those things in finding your identity in those things. And it's an easy trap to fall into. And people say, well, <clears throat> you know, that's talking about people who have possessions. I don't think so. I mean, yeah, it's a trap for people who have possessions, however you choose to define that, which, by the way, define rich for me. That's always a fun question. Nobody ever wants to answer that question. What is rich? Who is rich? At what point do you become rich? You see, everybody kind of assumes that there's this thing out here, but nobody really wants to drill down on it. The Bible is, <clears throat> is not... Listen, when God blessed Abraham and Job and Isaac and Jacob... He didn't just make them multi-millionaires. You sit down and do the math. He made them multi-billionaires with a B. It's never been about possessions. It's about finding your identity and letting those things possess you. And you know what? There are people who are as broke as broke can be, and I believe that they are fully in violation of the pride of possessions. Because that's all they think about. It's all they think about. It's no difference. You're just find, you just don't have them. You're finding your identity in them and you just don't have them. So what he's saying is these can't be the things. Listen, if... <clears throat> so... You get into all these different exercises at, at different places. But, uh, you know, you go to a place and somebody says to the whole group of you, we're going to go around and we're going to ask you to introduce yourself. Now, you tell us your name and you tell us who you are. And by who you are, that cannot be what you do for a living. They usually say that to a group full of men because men tend to identify with their jobs. I'm a... Who are you? This is my name. Well, what do you do? I mean, it's fine. I'm not 
saying there's some kind of diabolical scheme in it. I'm just, it's what it is. But <clears throat> how do you identify yourself? Don't worry. I'm introverted. I ain't going to go around and look at people and, and ask people in a room like this and say, all right, Chris, tell me who you are. I'm not going to do that. Um, that's what he's talking about. Is my identity a worldly one? Or is it a spiritual one? And what he's saying is, the identity that you've been given, the answer to that question when somebody says, who are you, and don't tell me what you do, the answer to that question is quite simple. I'm a slave of Christ. I'm a servant of God. That's it. That's what I do. Everything else, it just it falls under that category. So he gives the final explanation as to why this is not to be loved. In verse 17 when he says, And the world is passing away. The world is literally in the process of passing away. The world is passing away with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's what we were talking about a moment ago. The world is passing away with its desires. That stuff is fading. It's obsolete. That stuff that we thought we had to have that was going to fulfill us, that, you know, that's going to make me happy. When you die, it's the least of your concerns. You can't get to it. That's why Solomon says in Proverbs 23, don't set your heart on riches. If they come, that's fine, but don't set your heart on them because they'll soon take wings and fly upward to heaven. They'll fly away from you. And furthermore, I love Ecclesiastes because he gets so blunt. He says, and you know what? And you're going to die and you're going to give it to your kids and who knows whether he's going to be a dummy and spend it all. You worked your whole life to hand it over to a kid who's going to be dumb. Great. That's not me, that's Solomon. So you worked your whole life, never enjoyed it, desires are gone, and now you're in a place where it's, it literally makes zero difference. That's what John's saying. And that's what we have to constantly be aware of. But we'll, <clears throat> we'll pick up next week looking at some of the uh, application sides of these things and then the, uh, uh, move into the final section, verses 18 to 27.